Hello, thank you for inviting me to speak to this conference. My name is Svetlana Blitstein. I am the director of the Satanomia Clinic in Buffalo, New York, and I'm also the clinical associate professor of neurology at the University at Buffalo Jacobs School of Medicine. We're going to be talking today about the satanomia and headache in patients with hypermobility spectrum disorders and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. My disclosures, I am a financial consultant for CSL Bearing, and then I have a number of non-financial consulting activities that you can read here. Objectives today is to learn about the definitions of the autonomy and parts and how the autonomic nervous system works in general. We're going to review the types of headaches and non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic therapies for migraine and other headache disorders. We'll, we'll also talk about briefly about hypermobility spectrum disorders, because I think many of you are familiar with that topic. And we'll also briefly talk about mast cell activation syndrome. And then we'll conclude with understanding of the important association or a triad of the satanomia, hypermobility spectrum disorders, and mast cell activation syndrome in clinical practice. So I'd like to start with definitions. Uh, and dysautonomia is a general term that we use for any autonomic dysfunction or impairment. I use the analogy of a headache, which is a descriptive term and doesn't specify the headache type. As you see here, thick textbooks have been written on the topic of autonomic disorders. So of course, we're not gonna discuss those today, but I do wanna mention a couple of terms that you should know. One is this term autonomic neuropathy, which refers to dysfunction of peripheral autonomic nerves. Now, that's not the same as dysautonomia. For a diagnosis of autonomic neuropathy, we need to see objective evidence uh, of um, uh, the autonomic nerve dysfunction. So while it may seem that they're similar, they're absolutely not. We have common autonomic disorders, which we're going to talk about today. It's POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, neurocardiogenic syncope, or NCS, and neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, or NOH. We also have less common autonomic disorders, which are multiple system atrophy, pure autonomic failure, and autoimmune autonomic ganglionopathy, AAG, which we're not going to talk about today. And there are rare autonomic disorders like familial dysautonomia and amyloidosis, which we're also not going to talk about today. So what is the autonomic nervous system? It's an output system and it controls everything in our body, all of our functions, all of the organs. It consists of sympathetic, parasympathetic and enteric nervous system. Uh, and it's triggered, this output system is triggered by two inputs. One is sensory input from visceral or somatic receptors. And the second one involves inputs from the brain, uh, from your brain. And that's um, what processes all of your emotions, all of the stress responses and the homeostasis. And as you see here from this nice cartoon that our research associate drew, uh, she's also a cartoonist, Jill Brooke. You see nicely representation of the interplay between the brain and the autonomic nervous system. Uh, and certainly the autonomic nervous system um, is responsible for oxygenation of the brain through blood flow. Those are very important concepts. If you've ever taken physiology or anatomy courses, you recall that uh, autonomic nervous system consists of three systems. One is the sympathetic, the second one is parasympathetic, and the third one is enteric nervous system located in, in GI tract. Uh, and again, uh, what does the autonomic nervous system do? And the simple answer is everything. Uh, here you see the balance between parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems, which is very important in controlling um, salivation, pupillary size, heart rate, um, uh, breathing, digestion, 
It also modulates the release of uh, um, glucose uh, and other um, um, important hormones that control glucose metabolism from the pancreas. It also is responsible for secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine from the uh, uh, adrenal gland and also the bladder and sexual function. So how do we measure the autonomic nervous system by having autonomic function tests? And this is a standard laboratory testing, which you see here, and it evaluates cardiovagal, pseudomotor, or sweat response, and adrenergic autonomic functions. Now, not every city uh, or even every state in the United States, certainly not in Canada, uh, has these um, full autonomic labs. So I'll explain later how do we bypass uh, that shortage. We can still learn and test the autonomic nervous system with other tests. So the cardiovagal function is tested with heart rate and response to deep breathing at the defined rate and with Valsalva maneuver. The sweat response or pseudomotor function test evaluates the pseudomotor X and reflex test and the thermoregulatory sweat test. Those are the two tests that evaluates how you sweat. And the adrenergic function is evaluated with your tilt table test and the Valsalva response of blood pressure and heart rate. Okay, how do we diagnose POTS? Well, in the same way we diagnose any medical or neurologic condition, we have to go through detailed history. And here we ask patients whether they have orthostatic intolerance, whether they have postural tachycardia, whether they have exercise intolerance. A lot of patients with dysautonomia do not have good exercise tolerance and are unable to exercise. Do they have syncope or presyncope? Is there temperature dysregulation or fatigue? Those are the questions that we ask. And then we move on to physical exam. And of course, on physical exam, we look for signs of acrocyanosis, which you see here. Here is a, a healthy person standing. You look at their leg color. And here is a person with spots standing. And you see the difference in color. This is more blue and purple kind of uh, coloring. So we call that acrocyanosis. There are also signs of dryness on the physical exam that you can see, like dry lips and dry mouth. Importantly, you have to do a 10-minute stand test. Ask your doctor to do one on you. It's an easy test where heart rate and blood pressure are measured in the supine and standing positions. If you're seeing a neurologist or a uh, good physician that does neurologic exam, they should test your pupil size, reflexes, sensory exams, and then they should look how you walk. Are there evidence of Parkinsonism, gait ataxia, or unsteady gait that would suggest that these disorders are not POTS and more in the neurodegenerative category, more rare type of disorders that we're not going to discuss today. So what is the diagnostic criteria of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome? And here you see a, a good pictorial representation of a new POT scale uh, that was published by my colleague, Dr. Arthur Fedorowski from Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And it illustrates nicely various clinical features and symptoms of POTS. The diagnostic criteria are three, number one, you should have an increase in heart rate of at least 30 bits per minute within 10 minutes of tilt table test or a stand test. Number two, orthostatic blood pressure should not change or it has to remain the same. There should be no or evidence of orthostatic hypotension. Number three, symptoms of presyncope and orthostatic intolerance must be present for at least three months. We also have criteria for vasovagal syncope and neurocardiogenic syncope, as well as orthostatic hypotension, which are the other two common autonomic disorders that are also seen in patients with hypermobility spectrum disorders and hypermobile EDS. 
And that's the set criteria that we doctors use to diagnose, define autonomic disorders. Now, I do want to mention that if you do not qualify in any of those three diagnostic criteria, it doesn't mean you're healthy or it doesn't mean you have uh, no evidence of dysautonomia. It simply means you didn't qualify for these concrete diagnostic uh, uh, disorders. When this, when this happens, and if it's you that never qualified, but you're still very sick with autonomic symptoms, I simply use terms like autonomic dysfunction or the static intolerance or this umbrella term dysautonomia. All right, moving on to a TIL table test is a widely used and a widely available test that is essential to diagnosing autonomic disorders. Um, usually cardiology and uh, electrophysiologists run these labs. And the TIL tests for vasomotor, adrenergic, and cardiac sympathetic nerves. Uh, they, um, you see the picture here. Uh, you assess blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, um, uh, beat to beat in the supine or tilted. Here's the tilted 70 degree tilt with a man having a tilt table test. And you record these vital signs. The lab technician is recorded. And then the patient is returned to supine position and their vital signs continue to be recorded. Symptoms are important, not just vital signs, because a lot of people will feel sick while tilted. Here are the patterns that you see on the tilt table test for, let's start with spots, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. You see the, the um, uh, pink line is the heart rate and blue is the blood pressure. You see the blue line does not change, but the pink line continues to rise. The heart rate continues to rise when you're tilted and then it goes back down when you're supine. This is a pattern for POTS. Here in the neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, again, heart rate is in pink, blue is the blood pressure. And you see when the patient is tilted, you see how the blood pressure goes down and the heart rate doesn't rise up enough. And then when the patient is returned to the supine position, the heart rate and blood pressure normalize. This is the pattern for neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. We also have a skin biopsy that we can perform in an office uh, for evaluation of small fiber neuropathy, which is a common comorbidity with spots and hypermobility spectrum disorders. As I mentioned later on, at least 70% of patients with hypermobile EDS have small fiber neuropathy. And that's how we test. It's an easy punch biopsy that we take from distal and proximal leg. And we send that to a lab that can then look at the epidermal nerve fiber density and sweat gland density using immunohistochemistry. We can also stain these samples for amyloidosis with Congo red stain, and we can rule out amyloidosis, which is, you recall from my prior slides, is a rare autonomic disorder that you want to make sure you don't have. So this is a good, simple test that takes about 15 minutes in the, in the clinic to do. And here you see how we take out that piece of skin, and now under microscope, this is the normal uh, biopsy. And you see these little squiggly lines that are going down. Those are the nerve fibers. Now you see a patient with small fiber neuropathy and you see how these little nerve fibers are absent. And that's what happens in small fiber neuropathy. Okay, what are the POT symptoms? Well, if you happen to have POTS and listening to this lecture, or if you have an other autonomic dis disorder, you know the many symptoms that POTS can present with. And we can arbitrarily divide them in symptoms of cerebral hypoperfusion, like lightheadedness, weakness of the legs, difficulty concentrating or brain fog. We can also divide them in symptoms of sympathetic activation, which means your, fight and, your flight and fight system has been activated and you feel on edge, you feel shaky, you have tachycardia, you have flushing, you need to go to the bathroom off, often, maybe you even have chest pain and shortness of breath. And that's what we call autonomic um, um, symptoms or sim symptoms of sympathetic overactivity. 
You can also have GI symptoms and migraine, which are also rooted in autonomic dysfunction. So who gets POTS? Well, we know that about one to three millions of Americans had POTS before the pandemic, but now with COVID, which can cause post-COVID dysautonomia and post-COVID POTS, we think there are at least twice as many people in the United States. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the Canadian statistics are, but I know that in every country there has been a rise and more awareness and advocacy for POTS because um, many people with long COVID are now having autonomic disorders. So typically they're, 50, they're women ages 50, 15 to 50. Uh, but younger and older women and men can have them. 80% are women. Most of them are Caucasians, but there are some Hispanics and Blacks. And the, the reasons for this racial disparity is unknown. Certainly, there are pre genetic predispositions for autoimmunity in the Europeans. There are also variability in the absorption of renin and geotestin aldosterone. Um, uh, in, in black versus white population, but there also lack of awareness and access and certainly uh, social determinants of health that are important uh, to this topic. Comorbidities of POTS are many, and number one is migraine headache that occurs in 40% of patients with POTS. Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility spectrum disorders occur in at least 30%, and probably more if you count people who are just hypermobile without many other features of hypermobility spectrum disorders. Autoimmune disorders occur in at least 20% of patients. Various autoimmunities are more common than was the most common one being Hashimoto's thyroiditis, followed by rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's, and celiacs, as well as antiphospholipid syndrome. Mass cell activation syndrome is much prevalent, but in questionnaires and surveys, it only comes up for about 20%. I think a lot of patients with dysautonomia and mast cell disorders are simply undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. There are certainly immunologic dysfunctions that we see, this common variable immune deficiencies and selective immune deficiencies. And there are many unknowns in our field, like, you know, how many have uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, net transporter abnormalities, genetic problems. All of this has been under investigation. So we will talk about autoimmunity next. And years ago, I noticed that a significant number of my uh, POTS patients had positive autoimmune markers and comorbid autoimmune disorders. When we applied statistical analysis, we found that POTS patients had a higher prevalence of ANA, antiphospholipid antibodies, and other autoimmune markers than the general population. As you see from this figure, the prevalence of most defined autoimmune conditions was higher in my cohort of 100 patients with POTS than in general population with any type of autoimmune disorders affecting one in five patients with spots, and Hashimoto's thyroiditis being the most common, affecting 11% of patients. 25% of patients had positive ANA. And here you see um, the cartoonist are actually, is, was actually um, emphasizing my study in her cartoon uh, on autoimmunity um, uh, here. Uh, and you can look at it here as well. Okay. Many antibodies have been found in the serum of patients with POTS, so we think it might be an autoimmune disorder, but there haven't been any conclusive evidence or conclusive answers. We need more studies. So it appears that POTS may have strong autoimmune basis. As you see from the slide, various antibodies have been identified. Uh, to, uh, that are critical to the structure and function of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So it makes sense that these antibodies would be potential biomarkers in this disorder. Uh, we have made significant progress, but we're not there yet, so we need better tests and better labs to identify that. Um, but we do have an mo animal model of a rabbit that was created in Dr. David Kemp's lab at the University of Oklahoma. 
All these findings certainly have therapeutic implications with immunotherapy being uh, considered uh, in selected patients with POTS and the immunotherapy can be quite effective. So here is the rabbit on the tilt table test um, um, and the University of Oklahoma sign here. Okay. The pathophysiology of POTS is very complex. And I think that this is a central nervous system disorder. And I outline my thoughts and the evidence for my thoughts in this paper from 2022 in the Journal of Neurology called Is POTS a CNS Disorder? So this is a flow chart from my diagram and it's evolved. Uh, you can see how evolved that is, how many factors all of these boxes have, have, have had evidence for that. So they're not hypotheses, uh, but most of them have scientific evidence. And as you see here, I believe that uh, there is a increased pro-inflammatory state with increased sympathetic um, hyperactivity going towards CNS inflammation at the dorsal medulla, which is a brainstem area, and possibly other areas in the brain. Recall that hypovolemia is also a very important pathophysiology of POTS, and uh, it may lead to reduced CSF or cerebrospinal fluid volume as well. Um, Autoimmunity and genetic phenotypes are also very important. So quite complex. You don't have to go into details. Just understand that genetic predisposition, the antibodies that we have, small fiber neuropathy, hypovolemia, uh, central autonomic ne networks, increased sympathetic activity, pro-inflammatory state are all very important and can be tied together. Treatment of POTS consists of non-pharmacologic therapy with increased fluids and salt intake. We recommend fluid intake of about 3 liters per day and salt intake to at least 7 to 10 grams per day. But of course, con consult with your doctor to make sure you don't have hypertension or high blood pressure. We recommend abdominal binders, compression stockings, sitting and supine exercise, a lot of lifestyle changes. We in my clinic recommend a four-week trial of gluten-free diet because our study uh, recently showed um, significant improvement of patients with a triad of dysautonomia, uh, hypermobility spectrum disorder, and max mass cell activation syndrome. They, they had significant improvement in their symptoms on gluten-free diet. So now we ask our patients to go on a four-week trial of that. Pharmacotherapy is very important. We use beta blockers like atenolol, propranolol, metoprolol, and others. We use fludrocortisone, midodrin, pyridostigmine, or mestinone, which is an old myasthenia drug that is good for orthostatic intolerance. Evabridin is an eye channel blocker that is very helpful in tachycardia. And so Canada was ahead of the United States in using this drug. We have clonidine, sympatholytic, modafinil, methylphenidate, um, ADHD stimulant drugs. We use a lot of antihistamines because of, of overlapping mast cell hyperactivity. We use headache medications, uh, neuropathic pain medications, and others. But we also have other therapies emerging, like this immunotherapy. And hopefully we'll be able to show whether... IVIG, subcutaneous immunoglobulin, plasmapheresis, and other immunotherapies are helpful in our patients. We already know in case series that it can be very effective in many um, severe patients refractory to other therapies. So what about POTS and migraine headaches, the most common comorbidity? Like I said, we can use beta blockers. Propranolol especially is FDA approved for treatment of chronic migraine and migraine preventative medications. So this is a table you see from my paper on headache and dysautonomia published in Practical Neurology. You see all of these medications that can be used for treatment of autonomic dysfunction in general 
But then specifically in patients with spots and migraine, you can use beta blockers. I use a lot of um, uh, periactin or ciproheptidine, which is a very good medication. It's FDA approved for pediatric migraine, so it's safe. We can use amitriptyline and gabapentin. I use IV saline as needed for patients who have exacerbation of POTS and headache. Botox is obviously used for um, uh, um, treatment of chronic migraine. CGRP inhibitors are used very effectively, which are your Ajovi and Amovic. Uh, injections. Non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator is FDA approved now for treatment of migraine headache and cluster headaches and is also in clinical trials for POTS and chronic pain. So this is a non-pharmacotherapy that can be used if you don't tolerate medications well and a lot of our patients don't. Prognosis of POTS is extremely variable and if you hear this, you know, you had grow POTS, understand that in most patients, POTS is a chronic disorder. Uh, it's true that 50% of patients do improve, pediatric patients, improve over five years, but only less than 20%. So 19% mark themselves as the recovered patients. At least 25% of patients and more are very disabled. They cannot work or go to school. Disability is comparable to COPD and congestive heart failure based on studies. POTS's chronic disorder can fluctuate in severity, and the course of POTS is also variable during and after pregnancy, as my study showed um, early on. And again, here you see these are the lemons. This, these are the POTS and other disorders that I'm talking about today, hypermobility spectrum disorders, MCAS, they're very variable, they are complex, uh, and uh, they can obviously cause significant disability based on uh, the research studies that we have. These are the pearls that I do for other physicians. So if there are any healthcare providers in the audience, um, this is for you. Please always do orthostatic blood pressure and heart rate or a 10-minute 10, 10 stand test in patients where sus you suspect the satanomia. Uh, you can get a tilt table test if you have access, but if you don't, just do the orthostatic measurements. POTS is not just about the vital signs. Symptoms are important. And most disabling treatment resistance symptoms, in my experience, are fatigue, dizziness, and cognitive impairment. We always treat comorbid conditions, which is migraine, which is the neuropathic pain, insomnia, and joint pain, all of which are present in hypermobility spectrum disorders. Mythbusters is also for my um, healthcare uh, colleagues who work in this field. You know, there are a lot, uh, there are a lot of uh, misconceptions, and so we're trying to explain to them that POTS is not caused by anxiety, that POTS is not caused by deconditioning. All of these are secondary. POTS is not a functional neurologic disorder. SSRIs are not the first choice of treatment. The, the treatment is what I outlined in the last few slides. Beta blockers, Florinef, Evabridin, Midadrin, fluids. Fluids are very important. Oral fluids and IV saline. We try not to use IV saline regularly, but we do use them during flare-ups. Um, okay, moving on to headaches. There are many different headache types, but the most common are, number one, tension, occurring in 70% of people, then migraine, then cluster, and then many other ones. So we're going to be concentrating on migraine because it's the most common comorbidity, but tension headaches are also very important and prevalent in our patient population. Here we talk about headache types. And um, in this box, I give various headache scenarios for healthcare professionals, which would warrant an evaluation for autonomic dysfunction. And here on the bottom, you see headache and, mus and musculoskeletal complaints like joint pain, muscle pain, and frequent joint pain, joint dislocations. Um, suspicious for joint hypermobility or hypermobility spectrum disorders. So 
Um, this is published in the headache uh, literature. I'm trying to educate my headache colleagues not to miss hypermobility spectrum disorders, dysautonomia in their patient population. Various headache types can occur in patients with spots, migraine with and without aura, chronic migraine, tension headaches. Vestibular migraine is quite prevalent as well. Chronic daily headache, new daily persistent headache, coat hanger headache which occurs because a, a blood is pooling and the structures in the muscles and joints and ligaments in the back of your head and neck and shoulders uh, can very much be affected. Orthostatic headaches are very important and uh, should uh, point towards a possible inf investigation for CSF leak. And if there is no CSF leak, it could be uh, from just POTS or dysautonomia. Cervicogenic headache and medication overuse headache syndrome are also common. This is just to remind everyone what are the diagnostic criteria for migraine. Uh, and you need at least five attacks. Uh, the headache usually lasts four to 72 hours. The headaches are associated at least with two of the following. These are very important. Unilateral location, pulsating quality, moderate or severe pain intensity, and it's aggravated by or causing avoidance of routine physical activity. This criteria D is very important. You have to satisfy that. And it's nausea and or vomiting and phot photophobia and phonophobia. This is the criteria by which every neurologist and every uh, physician should go by in diagnosing migraine. The non-pharmacologic approach for migraine, interestingly enough, is, is not um, dissimilar to the non-pharmacologic approach for treatment of POTS. And so you avoid precipitants, you avoid certain medications that can worsen migraine instead of making it better. A lot of people have a tendency to take Tylenol and Motrin, you know, every day for their aches and pains, especially if you have joint pain. Understand that taking that more than three times a week can lead to medication overuse headache syndrome which is a very important problem in our patients. So you got to limit those to no more than two to three times a week. Treatment options are also hydration, just like in POTS, getting sleep and exercise, like in POTS, biofeedback, cognitive behavioral therapy, avoiding food triggers, same with POTS, uh, weather changes, barometric pressure uh, changes can um, cause a migraine headache can also worsen POTS. So there are many parallels. Supplements that are recommended in the headache field are magnesium, riboflavin, melatonin, CoQ10. Uh, Butterbore is no longer recommended. So these are uh, good, good to know and good to have discuss, with, discuss it with your doctor. We also have pharmacologic therapists for acute and preventative uh, migraine treatment. Again, in preventative, you see beta blockers, which are the first-line medications for treatment of dysautonomia and POTS. You can use anticonvulsants like Topamax and Keppra, neuromodulation devices or non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation, neurotoxins like Botox. There are other medications. Triptans should be more in this category of acute. Typically, triptans are not recommended as routine, but in some cases, you can certainly use those. And then monoclonal antibodies, G, uh, CGRP blockers like Ajovi and Amovic are, can be very effective as well. Acute treatment, treatments, ergotamine, uh, gepans, detans, uh, non-steroidals can be good too. Just don't overuse them. Uh, that's the point. All right, and so we come to this important triad of dysautonomia, hypermobility spectrum disorder, mast cell activation syndrome as migraine comorbidities, and what probably a good portion of you have. 
And this is the triad that I, you know, that we can represent with these circles. So they are overlapping. Some people have more of the other. Some people have all three problems. I talk about these issues in my recent paper that just came out uh, in the Neurology Journal. Uh, the references here, if you'd like to read more on that. We see these patients. They are very complex. The symptoms are usually many, but can be few. Uh, and all three syndromes need to be diagnosed and treated. That's very important. Oftentimes, I see doctors treat one, but not the other. Uh, I see neurologists treat migraine, but don't diagnose the cytonomia or mast cell. And it, it becomes very hard to control migraine headaches if you don't address other things that are present. Quickly, we'll go over that because I think uh, my colleague, Dr. Raj, is talking about that specifically. And it's his study that he presented on the prevalence of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome uh, um, and POTS. And you see that at least 25.5% in that study had both conditions uh, in a huge sample of uh, nearly 5,000 patients of POTS in an online survey. I suspect there are even more because you can be hypermobile and not know that. Uh, you can have uh, ankle dislocations frequent without any joint pain and not know that you have hypermobility. So I think this is the minimum number uh, that, that we see, probably much more uh, in, in real life. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, I'm not going to spend much um, because... Um, I know that you know these topics very well um, in this conference. So I'll, bl I'll briefly say that EDS is a group of genetic disorders involving collagen and other connective tissues. You know, collagen is everywhere. So once again, you expect multi-system, um, multi-systemic complex chronic um, disorders there. There are many different types of EDS. Uh, known and unknown mutations are present, but most common is hypermobile EDS. We do not have genetic tests for hypermobile EDS. There is the our clinical criteria set by the Ehlers-Danlos Society in 2017. You, you can refer there. Uh, and again, the cartoon points out that there is no cure. Multiple problems uh, are, are um, can exist. Uh, it is considered rare in general population, but we know that if we look at hyper, hypermobile EDS and hypermobility spectrum disorders in general, they're not going to be uncommon. Manifestations of EDS are many. Joints, subluxation, pain, arthritis, skin, easy bruising, bleeding, scarring, cardiovascular, autonomic, pots, leaky valves, enlarged aorta. You want to make sure you had cardiac echo to check for that. Aneurysms can be prevalent. Gastrointestinal symptoms and conditions, motility problem, GI pain, chronic constipation is, a, is very prevalent in patients with uh, hypermobility spectrum disorders. There are many complications, obstetrical, ophthalmo ophthalmologic, dental, allergic, immunologic, including MCAS that we're talking about today, autoimmune disorders, neurologic. And here I just want to briefly show the various skin and, and joint and hyperextensibility of the skin, discoloration um, of, of, of various people's cutaneous and joint manifestation in patients with EDS. Neurologic manifestations of EDS are numerous. So we want to concentrate on uh, what they are. And we'll start with spinal and mechanical complications that may result from weak collagen in the dura and the ligaments. You can have idiopathic intracranial hypertension. You can also have spontaneous intracranial hypotension. You can have high pressure headache and you can have low pressure headache. That's why EDS and neurology is so complex. You can have Chiari type 1 malformation. Uh, you can have tethered cord syndrome craniocervical instability, 
um, disc disease, tarlipsis, and many, many others. This is Chiari type 1 malformation MRI. You see the cerebellar tonsils are below foramen magnum. They're right there by the spinal cord. And you can have compression and you can have um, in, uh, increased intracranial hypertension and uh, high pressure headaches. So that those things are very important. I always obtain MRI of the brain in patients with spots and especially if they have EZS as well. This is craniocervical instability that can happen. It doesn't mean you need surgery. Surgery is only absolutely the last resort. So please don't uh, look for surgeons uh, if you just have neck pain and headache. Uh, surgery is reversed for very severe cases. Surgery also carries a lot of complications, especially in patients with EZS. But conservative measure, measures with physical therapy, maybe cervical collars, it can be considered. So um, get an evaluation. MRI of the brain is usually done. MRI of the cervical spine that you see here. And um, neuroradiologists who are trained in understanding and scoring this and measuring the angles, those are the people who need to decide if you have CCI. All right. Again. Other neurologic manifestations of EDS, number one, migraine and other headaches, small fiber neuropathy, dysautonomia, other types of neuropathy, various movement disorders, muscle spasms, cramps, stiffness. You can have hypotonia, myalgia, TMJ, that's very common. You can also have hearing loss. It's not talked about a lot, but it should be because sensory neural hearing loss can occur in patients with EDS, sleep apnea is both obstructive and central, as well as ADHD, ADHD and other um, neuropsychiatric manifestations are common. And I haven't even touched about the uh, psychiatric manifestations in this lecture. Again, this, this is from my colleagues uh, in, uh, uh, in healthcare. Uh, this is the Byton score that we use for hypermobility. A score of five and, and, and five and greater out of nine indicates hypermobility. Uh, there is a, a predominance of hypermobility in headache clinics and pain clinics and sleep clinics as well. So I'm trying to work together with our colleagues of all specialties uh, to diagnose and treat and not miss these patients. My four questions with um, my four questions to spot an EDSer or HSDer uh, are these: these are non-validated. Uh, this this is just my experience. What I do to spot them? Uh, I ask: Do you dislocate joints easily? Do you have chronic joint pain? Do you bruise easily? Do you have problems with your teeth or gums? And when the patient says yes to many of those questions, then suspect hypermobility spectrum disorder. Take home points on POTS and EDS for headache specialists are written here. Uh, I don't want to miss um, these uh, disorders in any of my patients. So this is again for healthcare provider. Uh, Ehlers-Danlos is a risk factor for both spontaneous intracranial hypotension and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I think that's very important. Uh, but also think about EDS in your patients with chronic joint pain and everyone who is diagnosed with this fibromyalgia, I use quotation marks because a lot of people with fibromyalgia have hypermobility spectrum disorders and small fiber neuropathy. If you have a patient with an intractable migraine, meaning no matter what you do, they still have horrible headaches, Think about POTS, think about MCAS, think about hypermobility spectrum disorders. So those are my points. And briefly, I want to talk about mast cell activation syndrome and mast cells in general, because they are comorbid with all of the disorders I am discussing today. Mast cells are very important to our immune system. They are the fastest to respond to any stimuli than any type of cell, than lymphocyte, than neutrophils. Mast cells respond in a second, in seconds, and they release various uh, substances, uh, chemokines, um, 
uh, mediators, cytokines, triptase uh, is there, released in seconds, histamine triptase, TNF-alpha. But it's very important to understand that most of our patients will test normal triptase level on testing, which leads me to this mast cell activation syndrome consensus two diagnostic criteria uh, that is set by Dr. Efren, Larry Efren and colleagues. This is this other diagnostic criteria. There is also the diagnostic criteria consensus one that rests heavily on elevated triptase level, but at least 95% of our patients do not have the elevated level. That doesn't mean their mast cells are working properly. So this is the table. The major criteria is constellation of symptoms and signs attributed to mast cell hyperactivity. And then the minor criteria is that there should be some evidence of blood and urine elevated mediators that we test for. Histamine, heparin, chromogranin, triptase is there, other mast cell specific mediators. And there is often a multifocal or disseminated infiltrates of mast cells in bone marrow or other organs, specifically GI tract. Uh, so this is the criteria your doctors can use to diagnose you. My final slide with the presentation is this patho pathohistochemistry slide that I want to point out. These squiggly lines are nerve fibers, they're in gold. This structure pink is uh, a, um, uh, a blood vessel, um, a small blood vessel. And these dark structures, they're mast cell with triptase in them, and which are stained black. And you see how close everything is located in anatomy. They All three structures, they communicate together. And I think that's the essence why we see this clinical triad of hypermobility spectrum disorders, dysautonomia, mast cell activation syndrome, Yes, we see these symptoms display in many patients. Um, so a very interesting slide to end their presentation, that we're not just talking clinically, we're actually talking anatomically. I think this is the key element in the triad. I think this is a very important element in long COVID or post-acute sequela a syndrome after COVID. Is this Location also important to post-vaccination syndromes in general, post-infectious syndrome in, syndromes in general? I think so. And, and that's what we need to study as scientists. Okay, so I will finish the slide with some of the pictures. Up on top, you see me teaching a course on long COVID. Uh, at the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Conference in Baltimore last year. I was the first author on the collaborative consensus guidance statement on autonomic dysfunction there, and that's the paper. Here below, you see our medical students from Jacobs School of Medicine in Buffalo, New York. Those are my research assistants and future neurologists. Here you see Selma Blair coming to visit us at the University at Buffalo, and we met while she was here. Um, she's uh, a, an advocate for multiple sclerosis, but she's also public with the fact that she has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome too. Uh, and here is a cartoon that the cartoonist gifted us for our 10-year anniversary of the Satanomia Clinic, Formation, Creation, and so thank you for inviting me. Hopefully you learned some useful information, whether you're a patient or a healthcare provider or, or you are a physician seeing these patients. I think it's very important that we acknowledge and learn about all these disorders to provide better patient care. Thank you very much.